since 1987, Canada and the U.S. have recognized 43 areas of concern. That is the 43 most severely polluted areas in the Great Lakes Basin. 30 years on, just seven of those have been delisted. So, where do things stand now in the effort to clean up these toxic hotspots? Let's ask David Ulrich. He is Executive Director of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative. Wendy Carney, Deputy Director, EPA, Great Lakes National Program Office. John G., Manager of the Great Lakes Area of Concern with Environment and Climate Change Canada. And, as you saw in the background piece there, Chris McLaughlin, Executive Director of BARC, the Bay Area Restoration Council. It's great to have you all here, you two from not too far away, our two friends here from Chicago. Nice to have you here uh, in the, the capital city of the province of Ontario. We just got the lay of the land for Lake Ontario, but we now want to just do another very short, minute and a half long piece with a broader view of where things are at with all the Great Lakes. So Sheldon, if you would, let's run that. In 1987, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between the United States and Canada created the so-called Areas of Concern, the most severely polluted areas in the Great Lakes Basin. There are 43 areas of concern, 26 in the U.S., 12 in Canada, and five are shared by both countries. To date, seven areas of concern have been removed from the list, four in the U.S. and three in Canada. Two areas have been listed as, quote, in recovery, Jackfish Bay on Lake Superior and Spanish Harbor on Lake Huron. In order to be delisted, areas of concern must target and remediate what are known as beneficial use impairments, and these include beach closings, restrictions on fish and wildlife consumption, restrictions on drinking water consumption, the presence of tumors in fish, bird or animal deformities and reproductive issues, eutrophication or undesirable algae, and loss of fish and wildlife habitat. Cleaning up these sites is, of course, very expensive. In 2007, Environment Canada estimated the cleanup cost for the Canadian areas of concern at $3.5 billion. Okay, some more background on all of the Great Lakes. David, get us started. What are some of the biggest problems that you're seeing as you look at the whole Great Lakes Basin? Well, the number one area of concern problem has been contaminated sediments from the very beginning. Uh, with industrial discharges over many, many years, a lot of contaminants, particularly PCBs, polychlorinated biphenols, have wound up in those sediments. It's a very expensive process. There was a lot of resistance to it at the outset as well, people saying, you're only going to make it worse by digging it up, and they were thinking about mechanical dredging. But hydraulic dredging, which is like a big vacuum cleaner, was developed relatively quickly, and slowly but surely, we were able to demonstrate that you can remove these sediments uh, effectively without contaminating the water column. It's expensive, and that has been the biggest hurdle all along. That has been one of the biggest ones. Uh, combined sewer overflows from municipalities is a big one. A lot of the habitat has been degraded. Those are some of the serious problems. Let me do a follow-up on the chemicals. <clears throat> the chemicals that are in the water because of overflow from industrial use, have they been there, some of them, for 100 years? Oh, yeah, easily. Uh, the steel industry on the southeast side of Chicago and northwest Indiana has been there since uh, before 1900, and they just built up and built up and built up over the years, and nothing had been done about them. And they slowly seeped out into the lakes as well. And they never go away, do they? No, they don't. Hmm. Wendy, what would you add to that list as you look at the areas of concern across the Great Lakes Basin? I think that I, I agree with Dave that um, some of the biggest problems we see initially are some of the contaminated sediment issues. Um, but we also are seeing a lot of issues related to habitat loss um, and degradation as a result of urbanization in some of the areas of concern. So in addition to trying to clean up the sediments, we are taking areas where you know, habitat has actually been lost and trying to put habitat back into some of the areas of concern. And finding that it actually can be somewhat expensive to do that because you're recreating environment that just basically was, was eliminated from some of these areas of concern. I understand why if there's a nuclear plant on the shores, you know, there will be issues associated with that. Or if there's a steel company on the shores, there will be issues associated with that. But absent those things, do you know why a particular area of concern becomes a particular area of concern? Is there something in, you know, endemic to that area that makes it so? Well, I think just it's the level of, of degradation. These places were severely degraded places for a variety of reasons. Some of them were contaminated sediments, some of them were degraded fish populations. Uh, 
algae and, and so on in the water, um, you know, it, it depended on the area because some sites like Hamilton were, you know, heavily industrialized. Toronto was highly urbanized. Uh, and then our northern AOCs, it was, you know, pulp and paper mills. They, uh, you know, I can remember as a kid uh, um, traveling to Expo 67, you could smell Cornwall before you could see it. And it was really the pulp and paper. Those were a big and obvious problems. Well, you know, I'm from Hamilton, as are you, Cam. We used to have a joke when I was growing up in Hamilton, which is, I would never want to live in a city where I couldn't see the air I was breathing. <laughs> now, <laughs> and, you know, it's funny how much things have changed, because I know when I was a kid, and you used to see all the stuff coming out of the stacks at Stelco and DeFasco, and you knew what was going in the water there, you know what we called that 50 years ago? We called that progress. That's, that, they were employing tens of thousands of people down there. You have a bit of a different view of it today, I guess, eh? We do, especially given that tens of thousands of those jobs that might have paid $70,000 30 years ago, yeah. um, those have evaporated. Um, it's a very different economy in Hamilton now. And in fact, many of the people that we meet um, who are out rediscovering the environment around the bay, having returned to the city after 20, 30 years, can't believe their eyes. There's a whole, there's a, there's a, a burgeoning new culture, I think, that, that, doesn't, um, that doesn't hold on to that we're Hamilton, we don't deserve nice things uh, kind of attitude. I get that, but you know what? 60 years ago, I think there was a Toronto urban planning professor who called Hamilton the world's largest and most beautiful septic tank. Is that a fair <laughs> description back then? Yes, it would have been accurate, actually. <laughs> and how about today? Uh, completely turned around, in fact. Um, I, I had... Uh, I had a committee member one time at a meeting say that our job at BARC is not to uh, cheerlead for the municipal government, for example. And I said, Hamilton Water has great leadership, lots of great progressive ideas. I'm not happy necessarily with everything that the city's doing, but I go on the front page of The Spectator in a pom a pom-poms and a tutu um, for really great projects. And so you have up until 1964, it's fair to say, almost unmitigated sewage flowing into the bay. Um, just a frightening amount. And you have in 1964 the first uh, wastewater treatment plant. And since then, uh, with the recent upgrades of a half a billion dollars to the Burlington's plant and Hamilton's wastewater treatment plant, you've got two. Uh, Burlington's has just come online. The, uh, the renovations are completed there. Uh, Hamilton's will be done by 2022. You'll have two of the best plants in North America. Uh, the outflow from those plants will be below the targets for phosphorus, for example, that the RAP has set. Um, and that's 50% of the water flowing back into the bay. So a remarkable change of, of, of events, uh, a real achievement for the community, can something you, to be really proud of. Can you go in the water yet? You can go in the water yet. And, and you hit on something that's probably dearest to my heart, which is the, the whole perception of the issues that we're going to be talking about, and Hamilton in particular, perceptions have not caught up with reality. Uh, reality is not fully embraced all the accomplishments that we need to reach yet, but the perception that Hamilton Harbor is one big, uniformly dangerous place uh, is simply no longer true. That doesn't mean that we have uh, accomplished everything that the RAP needs to do, but the fact remains that you can safely, insofar as uh, bacteria, for example, um, you can safely go in the water most places most of the time. And in fact, uh, in advance of conversations like this earlier this summer, I made sure I had my picture taken, the high-level bridge in the background, because the only answer to the question, if I've been in, is, is yes. It's so yes, yes, absolutely. But I, I'll have to tell you that having worked on this for years, actually, and having swam in lakes and rivers all over the place, uh, everywhere in Ontario, having grown up actually in Peterborough, and waters the calling card in the Kawarthas, um, it was strange. It's strange going in Hamilton Harbor because we, are, we have been, as a community, so detached from, from our water, from this amazing natural asset. And told for decades not to go in. So it does feel somewhat strange. We should just say, you keep saying rap, which is not a kind of music that you're referring to. You're talking about the remedial action plans I am, that correct. have been brought to bear. Yeah, okay, right. I want to find out more about all of your missions. David, let's start with you here. The Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative. What is that? Well, we're a group of 123 U.S. and Canadian cities representing about 17 million people. And the primary reason we were formed by <clears throat> former Mayor Daley of Chicago and Mayor Miller of Toronto and uh, Mayor uh, Jean-Paul Lallier of uh, uh, Quebec City was that cities were 
really left out of the discussion on what should the future of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence be. And they were all relatively assertive people and said, you know, I think cities have some good ideas and we shouldn't just sit back and be told by provincial, state, and federal governments what to do. So why don't we get seats at decision-making tables and go say what we think? Secondly, we wanted to establish a best practice, practices network because a lot of good ideas were being developed in cities all across uh, Canada and the U.S. on the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence. So why not set up a system with website and best practices so we can share <coughs> these types of things and good things are happening all over. The third thing is that the mayors felt that not enough attention was being paid by Ottawa and Washington to the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence. Twenty percent of the surface fresh water of the world one of the most magnificent natural treasures on the planet, and not that, invest that much investment in it. So we started with a focus on water quality, water quantity, and waterfront vitality, and then have grown into a broader uh, integrated agenda of sustainability with economic, social, and environmental issues. We try to lead by example in who, our cities. Who do you work for? Um, I work for these 123 mayors. So do, are, you, are you paid by the cities? Yeah. Yeah. You guys, well, you work for municipalities. Yeah, uh, I'm not an employee of the municipalities. We're an organization, a charitable organization in the U.S. We have a, par a parallel Canadian organization. We function as one organization. I call us Mayors Without Borders. <laughs> and uh, okay. honestly, over the years, we have never had a Canadian U.S. battle. We've never had a big city, small city battle. We've ne never had a liberal conservative battle. It gets pretty dicey during the Stanley Cup final. So. But other than that, we get along really well. And it's all about the lakes and what quality of life and economic well-being. Which are the specific areas of concern that you are working on? Well, we don't get that directly involved in them. But um, Milwaukee is one of them uh, where indirectly we've been involved. And Sheboygan, uh, we were up there this summer. Wisconsin. At Sheboygan, Wisconsin, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, home of bratwurst and other good mm -hmm. Wisconsin delicacies. And uh, the St. Louis River estuary between Duluth and Superior. We've had some engagement in those. And our watchword is we will get involved if we can make more and better things happen faster. And where we can do that, we do try to inject and in getting you know the, a mayor at a political level saying you know we got to do this. But if things are moving along okay, then we'll stand back. So we don't get too heavily involved, but we are involved in some of them. Wendy, what's your mission? So as the Great Lakes National Program Office, um, we are a sort of an office inside of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, um, but we're an office that focuses solely on the pre protection and the restoration of the Great Lakes. So. Um, prior to about 2010, the office had a pretty much a much smaller, you know, financial budget, and we focused a lot on collaborating, bringing stakeholders together to try to solve problems on the Great Lakes, focusing on implementation of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and making sure that we were gathering data, essentially, on the health of the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. um, around 2010, we um, had a presidential initiative launched. Um, that put a lot of financial backing behind a lot of the legwork that had been done by the office and folks to sort of define what the problems were and what we really needed to focus on in terms of restoring the Great Lakes on the U.S. side of the border. Um, and since then, we have been charged um, essentially with spearheading that entire initiative. So we work with 16 other federal agencies, um, as well as many state agencies, local entities, local governments, uh, non-governmental organizations, and try to facilitate restoration across the Great Lakes on a number of issues. You're talking to a Canadian audience here, and because of that, I'm going to ask you this flippant little question, okay? Mm -hmm. Michigan is the only Great Lake that's entirely in the United States. Do you therefore care about it more than all the others? No. Prove it. <laughs> <laughs> Prove it. Okay, so uh, we have many uh, Great Lakes areas of concern, for example, that we have essentially put lots of money into. So just this last year, we've put about $18 million into the Clinton River area of concern to actually work on a number of habitat restoration projects. Where Up, is that, the Clinton River? That is on Lake Erie. Okay. Um, in Ohio, so. Okay. And um, we have put a, a lot of money up in the, the Buffalo River 
area of concern as well. Um, some significant dredging projects have taken place up there, um, and we're working with the um, local entities up there on a number of habitat restoration projects as well. Are the areas of concern, as they are so-called, is that the front, basically the front lines in the battle against trying to remediate these lakes? Uh, the areas of concern are sort of the areas that have the greatest number of issues that need to be resolved in, and so they are very quantifiable in terms of sort of the progress that we're making in the lakes as a whole. Um, through our initiative, though, we are also focused on invasive species, um, habitat um, restoration, and species populations that are not in areas of concern, as well as both agricultural and urban runoff as well. So the initiative covers a wide range of issues, but overall, the largest proportion of the money in the initiative, about one third of the money we're getting every year, is actually going towards cleanup in areas of concern. And no Nobody believes me when I tell them this. Which president created the Environmental Protection Agency? Richard Nixon. Richard there Nixon you go. is correct. <laughs> December Richard Nixon. 2nd, 1970. Richard Nixon. Nobody believes truth. Okay, John, let's bring you in at this point. I want to ask you we saw a, a, a sort of a, a hint of this in Meredith Martin's background piece. Uh, Port Hope and all of the right. issues around Port Hope because right. of the nuclear plant there right. and what's now in the right. sediment. Right. Is there any hope of cleaning all that up? Yeah, it's it's ra actually it's, it's radioactive waste from processing uh, from the mills there going back into oh the 40s probably or the or the 30s. Uh, it's the harbor itself that is is the concern, and it only has one beneficial use impairment, and that beneficial use impairment is restriction or degradation of benthos, which are the little craters that live in the sediment. Uh, the Canada's Port Hope Area Initiative in the next few years will remove that sediment and place it in the uh, storage facility that's under construction now. So to do that, they'll have to replace all the harbor walls, they'll have to coffer dam it, dewater it, remove it, put it into the disposal facility, uh, and restore it so that it becomes a functioning harbor. That right sounds now. very expensive. How much is all that going to cost? Um, it's probably in the realm of about 50 to 75 million. And it'll get the job done? The, fun, the program is there, and it's on the books, mm -hmm. uh, but they have to get the storage facility in place first. So that's that, that, I think, is the focus of the area initiative right now, and then they'll move on. They're also cleaning up sites throughout the town, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the harbor mm -hmm. itself. And once they have that done and monitoring shows that uh, it's being recolonized by the critters that inhabit the bottom, uh, Port Hope will be ready to be delisted. <laughs> How did all the radioactivity get in the water to begin with? And I presume this is 50, 60, 70 years yeah, ago. It, it's because in producing, um, uh, producing the, <laughs> um, the product they wanted, it generated a huge waste stream. So they had to put that, and they put it really everywhere all around the town, and a lot ended up in the harbor. Um, so Period, it, full stop. It's a, it's a big challenge there. Hmm. Would you say that, that you're ch trying to get a better understanding of your prime mission? whether it's to sort of clean up all the mess that has already happened or trying to prevent further messes from happening. What would you say? Well, it's obviously a combination of both, but I think it's really important to look at this cleanup of areas of concern in perspective. Uh, going back to, you mentioned the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency on the U.S. side, and I know in Canada as well, is when the full range of environmental laws were being passed. That was all designed to stop the bleeding. Let's not make it worse than it already is. Mm. And that was a big challenge in and of itself. And then in the early 80s and ultimately in the 87 revisions to the Water Quality Agreement, people realized, wait a minute, we got to go back and undo some of the things that we have done before. And the whole theory behind the areas of concern <clears throat> was that uh, you know, the Great Lakes are massive. You got to start somewhere. So you set priorities in the most contaminated areas. Let's concentrate our efforts on that. Mm -hmm. It's taken much longer than anybody would have liked. Nothing like this had been done before. Why People, has it taken so much longer? Well, because this hadn't been done before. Nobody knew how to do it, and there wasn't the money to do it. So th there wasn't the money to do it, to my head, sounds like lack of commitment by political decision makers. Well, I, that's part of it, yeah. And I don't think anyone had any idea of what the magnitude of the task was, hmm. because things like this had not been done before. And as they got into it, and there wasn't like a liability system that was set up 
like under these regulatory laws where mm -hmm. this company has to stop that pollution by this amount of time. This didn't really make anybody do anything. EPA, Environment Canada, others had to go out and say, this is a problem, let's all get together and try to solve it. Well, who's going to start putting money on the table to do that? It was a very, very difficult process. And as Wendy mentioned, on the U.S. side, it wasn't until 2002 we had something called the Legacy Act, and that was an infusion of money. But then in 2010, to the tune of $300 million a year, that's a real game changer. Then you can go out and not only do things directly yourself, you can leverage other money. So um, I, I know it would have been greater to have done it faster, but there are good reasons why it didn't happen. And let me do one more follow-up here with Chris, and that is on hearkening back to that video. You're trying to create this containment area where you want to hopefully have all of the pollution in that area, making everything around it more pristine. Where's that at right now? So just to be clear, BARC is a community organization where the public interest uh, involved in the restoration of the harbor. Uh, the Randall Reef project you referred to is actually John's baby. The federal government is the lead project. We're not actually one of the actors in the project itself. Our job uh, for 25 years, in fact, has been to both participate in the process. So John and I, as representatives of the non-governmental and governmental uh, agencies in the Remedial Action Plan for Hamilton, uh, sit at the same table, and we both have actions under uh, action items that we're responsible for. So we, um, we produce um, community events and school programming to educate young people. Um, John helps pay for wastewater treatment plants, for example. So we both have a role to play, uh, and we come at it from different angles okay. like that. John, let me follow up with you then. That, that which, you described it in the video, which is why I went to you first, right. but of Randall course, Reef. it's your program. Yeah. Yeah. Tell, us, tell us what stage that's at right now. Well, Randall Reef is now under construction. Construction started uh, fall of uh, 2015. Uh, this past spring, we started actual construction of the main containment facility. And basically, it's a three-stage job. Build a six-hectare, double-walled engineered containment facility. Uh, stage two is dredge all the contaminated sediments surrounding it into it. Stage three is basically put a lid on that big box, dewater it, uh, cap it with an impermeable cap, pave it, turn it over to the Hamilton Port Authority, which is really important because you need a revenue stream to monitor and maintain it in the long term, and that's what they'll do. When will that be done by? It'll be finished by 2022. It's a big project. What's There's the a lot of it's uh, it's just slightly under 140 million dollars. And is it federal government? Federal no, it, it is it? really a unique private-public partnership. It's um, Canada's putting in a third, Ontario's a third, and the local community, which is made up of the city of Hamilton, the Hamilton Port Authority, U.S. Steel Canada, city of Burlington, and uh, Halton Region pick up the balance. Uh, U.S. Steel contributed the steel and its fabrication. <laughs> And it's interesting to note that um, the steel going in in the form of pilings, if you were to lay those pilings end to end, they would extend almost from the site to Toronto, it's about 38 kilometers hmm. of a ribbon of steel that long. So it's a lot of steel. Do you have any doubt but that this will work? Oh, we're certain it'll work. You're sure it will work? Yep. How do you know? Has it been done before? Uh, it's unique and it's a unique combination of things. So various parts have been done elsewhere, but it is um, highly engineered. Uh, the walls are more than half an inch thick. Uh, it's being monitored. It's double walled. Um, yeah, it'll 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 work. It'll work by yeah. 2022. Well, we're hoping it'll be finished by 2022. The project is currently uh, on schedule. We're only a year in. We're on budget. Again, we're only a, a year in. Um, hopefully it stays that way. And the um, uh, job is going really well right now. Good. Wendy, let me bring you in on these. Again, we showed at the very beginning here. Since 1987, 43 so-called toxic hotspots, areas of concern. Mm -hmm. How would you characterize the progress or lack thereof, that's been made on all of those hotspots since then? So, um, you know, John and I have worked, you know, together basically under the Water Quality Agreement, under the Annex. Um, at least on the U.S. side, we are, we're, we are moving things, I think, um, a little bit faster than we have in the past. We've had more money to basically move projects, I think, on the U.S. areas of concern. Um, we've 
since 2010, since we sort of got had our initiative started, we've actually delisted three areas of concern. So that's a that was a huge. Um, you know, jump forward considering from 1987 until that point in time, we'd only been able to delist one. So that that is a big step forward for the US. Um, but on top of that, we have four additional areas of concern that we've already finished all of what we call the on ground in water type work that needs to happen. And now we are in a monitoring phase, basically watching to see whether the results we hope will, will come out of all the work we've done in those areas of concern are achieved and we can actually move towards delisting could take several years before we get there because the environment takes time to recover sometimes. David, a follow-up to you. If I've got the math right here and my numbers are right, in almost 30 years, you have delisted seven of the 43 areas that were initially listed as the areas of concern. Seven out of 43. For an untrained ear, that's not going to sound like a lot of progress. Well, Is you're that wrong. right? No. I, it's like, I'm, I've been trying to think of how to explain this. Uh, and let me try. It's like you have 43 baseball games going on at the same time. And you've got work going on on all 43 of those sites or 43 baseball games. And you get to the fifth, sixth, seventh inning, and you've scored a bunch of runs. You've done a number of things. You've uh, improved the usage of it by doing some of the cleanup. But the bean doesn't drop in the bucket until somebody wins or loses the game at the end of the game. So a tremendous amount of work has been done on all of these, but this delisting and completion of all of the management actions is when something is counted. So there really has been a lot more progress than has appeared. And unfortunately, somewhere along the line, someone decided that this was the primary way, because it's always easier just to count stuff like that, mm -hmm. that this was the primary way to judge the effectiveness of the program. But you think um, it doesn't indicate how much progress is actually made? Absolutely not. Okay, absolutely. well, let's try this. Huge amounts. You should count yeah. the number of impairments. <clears throat> like, the number of impairments across at least the Canadian AOCs have dropped by 40% now. There Over was, what period of time? Well, in the beginning, there was uh, about 100 and, uh, 145, 100, whatever. There's, 65 have been have been declared not impaired. 81 remain, mm -hmm. whatever that adds up to as a, as a total. So that's where we are now. There's another 20 where we have to make a decision one way or the other. But you know, those 65 came at a large effort and represent uh, a, real, a real improvement. Okay, well, last week, a joint progress report on the Great Lakes was released by both of our countries. And here's some of the highlights. Let me just read this. Since 2012, the United States has delisted three areas of concern, Presque Isle, Deer Lake, and White Lake. It has completed actions at four areas of concern, Sheboygan Harbor, Waukegan Harbor, Ashtabula River, and St. Clair River, and will complete actions at River Raisin by November. Canada's list is a little shorter. We have apparently completed actions at Nipigon Bay on the north shore of Lake Superior this year. What do you think, John, accounts for the success that you've had since the last progress report, which I think was four years ago? Accounts for the success. Well, we've moved forward on, really, BOIs across the board. Ten, ten have been removed in that uh, three-year period, so that's progress in itself. And there's probably another, oh, probably another dozen or so that will come up for removal in the next 18 months or so. But I guess, I mean, I'm seeing lots of success on the American side of the border, and I'm not seeing much success on the Canadian side. Well, I don't think it's. I don't think it gives you the true story just to count uh, delisted AOCs. Right? And I, I think I agree with John. I mean, sometimes you know you're you're comparing an apple and an orange when you just do the counting and you just look at the numbers. You have to kind of actually compare what the size and the magnitude of the problems are in each individual AOC. They're all unique. They take different. Um, types of actions basically to get to that end. Um, some areas of concern might have two or three beneficial use impairments and you can kind of achieve that completion of the work um, maybe a little bit quick, quicker, for example. Others, you know, you could be talking about we have areas of concern in the United States um, where all 14 beneficial uses exist. We're still working on them. That doesn't mean we're not working on them. They're not in my count. But we are working on them, you know, where we're investing money, we're dredging sediments, we're doing habitat restoration. So I think there's a bigger story here than just the numbers. 
Um, I think the numbers in and of themselves show progress because they show both the U.S. And, and Canada sort of accelerating their efforts, particularly since this new water quality agreement came into place. Um, but I think the real story is behind all the work that's going on in all the AOCs, and the beneficial use impairments do, to a certain extent, kind of tell that story a little bit better. So the fact that you're continuing to remove beneficial use impairments, it means that you're actually making progress in AOCs, um, areas of concern, areas of concern mm -hmm. where you're not necessarily achieving that end counting point, you know, where you've completed all the work or you're actually getting to delisting. Gotcha. Chris? Yeah, I guess I just, uh, our, our job at, at BARC, um, the, the organization came out of the initial citizens uh, movement in the north end of Hamilton 45 years ago. The first uh, people to look out their window into the bay at the dumping and the pollution and said that enough is enough. Our job is not to, uh, we have an interesting role actually, our job is not to apologize for the numbers that you've been given. I, I see our job as uh, an honest broker of information, uh, communications, uh, a vehicle for communications to the community that's non-governmental. And I, I would agree, in large part, uh, what this discussion highlights is the, the difficulty in explaining the complexity of the task to the general public, mm -hmm. which may or may not <clears throat> dip their minds into these issues very often. They, they see highlights, like you've just suggested. It's difficult because this is all of these uh, remedial action plans and, and recovery of these areas are works in progress. And I think they're a lot more complex, two steps forward, one step back. And not that we apologize for those things, but we have to give the process enough grace to, to allow elected officials, for example, to fund experiments uh, in policy and to make some mistakes, to spend more than seems reasonable to the untrained eye, perhaps. Um, because uh, I think, as, as you pointed out, David, from the very beginning, these were not seen as nearly as complex, certainly speaking for Hamilton Harbor. Um, the Randall Reef Project started out um, two, two orders of magnitude smaller than it ended up being. Yeah. Um, like I said in the video, we're talking three professional hockey arenas being in, in terms of the, vo the volume of material that we're dealing with there. And going back to the late 1980s, we had no idea that there was that much material there. So as we go along, and really, I think the, the Great Lakes Agreement between the con two countries, as it's evolved and recognized through new science and new policy tools, um, the Remedial Action Plan uh, itself is a policy innovation recognizing new realities. Um, okay, let me jump in here, because uh, with time running out, I do want to, you're all in town, obviously, for this Great Lakes Forum uh, that's happening down at uh, Exhibition Place in the Allstream Center. And uh, I, I just want to play a little tape from this, because... The very first area of concern apparently to be removed from the list was here in Canada. It's about two hours north of the studio, Collingwood Harbor. Gail Kranzberg, who's now at McMaster University, was apparently a major player in the restoration of Collingwood Harbor. And TVO host Nam Kiwanuka was down at the Allstream Center for the Great Lakes Public Forum. She interviewed Gail about those efforts, and we want to play just a snippet of that conversation now. Sheldon, please. Why do you think the program to delist Collingwood was so successful? Well, Collingwood is a very special place. First of all, there's a passion in the people in Collingwood. They they believe they live on the they do believe and they do live on the pristine waters of Georgian Bay. They have a beautiful harbor. They've got Blue Mountain behind them. Boaters in the middle of the summer go skiing at lunchtime, and it's just a beautiful place. And it was not on their agenda to be a toxic hotspot. It just they were stuttled, stunned by it, startled by it, and anything they could do to make that vision of a healthy, thriving community come to life. They were dedicated to doing that. So everybody in town got to know that we are working collaboratively to make the, to make the harbor healthy. Um, and so they were connected to the place? Town council, we had the mayor as one of the citizens sitting around the table saying, what is it that we're going to do? Mm -hmm. We had radio shows in the newspapers we were always um, had a voice out telling people how they can get involved, how they can help, what they can do individually, how they can help us bring the harbor back to life. And it was a success because everybody got engaged and everybody wanted to make the, the harbor great. It's a big deal to be delisted because since 1987, 
only three areas of concern have been delisted in Canada. Why so few, so few sites delisted? There's a few reasons for that. In some situations, the degree of, de of degradation has been going on for a very long time. Huge industrial facilities needing hundreds of millions of dollars and that money is hard to find. Mm -hmm. In some of the communities, they just weren't engaged. There are much smaller and simpler problems to solve than we had in Collingwood, mm -hmm. but the citizens are not involved and there's no sense of vision or passion. So you, you need the leadership, you need the passion, you need the communication. You also ideally don't have to spend billions of dollars on infrastructure, which is what we have to do in the city of Toronto, for example. Mm -hmm. The city of Toronto and region is an area of concern. But the amount of investment and time is going, just going to be much longer. If there's one thing that we have really learned this week, I think, and David, I'll bring you in on this. We take the Great Lakes for granted. And I hear it in that answer there, and you probably all see it in your work as well, the importance of community engagement in order to get decision makers to move. How key is that? Absolutely essential. And in fact, I can still remember Mayor Daly saying, we take, the, take, take these lakes for granted, and we cannot do that. And that's one of the things, as Gail mentioned, on the uh, community involvement and the mayor being at the table there. They are there interacting with the community, being held accountable by the community, being part of enjoying the resource, and getting that kind of engagement, I think, really, really works well. So and my follow-up to Chris, <clears throat> then, is how do you make that happen? Not easily, that's for sure. Um, there's certainly a, there's a, a mountain of perception to overcome. Uh, I think that for 50 years, for example, the whole country has flown into Toronto, rented a car to go to Niagara, uh, and they've seen, they've seen the bay and the city twice from the bridge, and uh, they see a whole lot of Mordor and not a lot of Muskoka. Uh, but a lot of Muskoka exists. Uh, when you get it back up into the West End, into Coots Paradise Marsh. It's in Hamilton you're talking about. In Hamilton, yeah. The harbor and the, bay, the, the marsh. Um, yeah, part of the, I think the, really the big challenge is reconnecting people. That physically and subsequently psychologically, the community was cut off from the, from the bay. A deliberate decision was, was made to replace those low-lying coastal wetlands on what is with industry on the south shore and steel mills uh, went where there was once wildlife and following that uh, literally a chain link fence went up from the the west end to the in the in the west end to the to the east and the community was cut off literally and figuratively but like the, over generations that had a huge psychological effect. And so a lot of our work in terms of having workshops and, uh, and community events to celebrate success, re-engage people, get people literally in the marsh planting cattails, for example, which is a highly satisfying uh, uh, exercise in community building. Um, we also go out into the community. We, we teach, or, sorry, our programs and schools reach thousands of kids every year. And I think that you alluded earlier to the fact that this is going to take a long time because to fix these problems because the problems took a long time to create. Took a long time to create. Let's throw some more numbers up here just in hopes of painting a, a broader picture here. In 2007, Sheldon, I'm on page six now. Uh, follow me here with board number three. In 2007, Environment Canada estimated cleanup costs for all the Canadian areas of, of concern at $3.5 billion. In a section of the report called Inadequate Funding, in the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario's annual report from a couple of years ago, Here's what we learned. The Canada-Ontario Great Lakes Action Plan only has an annual budget of $9.3 million. It also noted that this budget does not include provincial investments in infrastructure for water and wastewater or the funds dedicated specifically to the Hamilton Harbour area of concern. I know we have no politicians sitting at this table, but I've got to ask anyway. John, come on in here. Are we inadequately funding the job? Well, the $9 million, I think, is the provincial contribution. The uh, Canada's Great Lakes Action Plan is, uh, is currently $8 million per year ongoing, but that's only a small piece of the puzzle. puzzle. That largely facilitates community involvement, wrap offices, ecological restoration, and so on. In all of the Canadian AOCs, to date, the expenditure on wastewater upgrades has been about $1.4 billion. The investment in sediment remediation is close to 
200 million. Uh, if you add up all the rest, ecological restoration projects, that's in around 150 million or so. So it's, those numbers are just a small slice, but it's a much bigger, uh, a much bigger expenditure there and more to come. Here's the follow-up question. Obviously, for this to work, your country and our country have to work extremely well together. Otherwise, we're just sort of spitting into the wind. Level with us here. How well do you and your Canadian counterparts work? Extremely well. No, no, really. No, I really want to know. This. Except during the Stanley Cup. Finals. Except during yeah. the finals. All no, right. I, I, I'm absolutely, totally honest. Within our organization, we have never had a Canadian-U.S. Uh, standoff on things, and I, you know, I've worked closely with Canadians for the last 30 years, and uh, in some respects, I work better with them than some other people from the U.S. Oh, do tell. Yeah. Well, I asked the question because today at the Great Lakes Public Forum, which you are all in town to participate in, Chuck Lawson from the International Joint Commission said, I don't think there is very much coordination between these shared areas of concern. That's what he said. He's on the record with his name. Well, it's very interesting think? because I, this morning, communicated with uh, an individual who works for EPA down in the Detroit area. And she said that she believes that the coordination on the uh, Detroit River area between the U.S. and the Canadian side is excellent. Wendy, what's your experience? My experience is, is that we actually do more coordination. And we actually responded to his remark um, as, as part of the forum as well. Um, but we have an agreement in place between the U.S. and Canada on how we're going to coordinate in those areas of concern that are considered binational, where they're jointly um, owned basically by the U.S. and Canada. And, you know, I think that the process works pretty well. Um, you know, there is a, a binational public advisory committee basically for each one of those areas of concern where people from Canada and the U.S. jointly as a community are kind of working through the issues in their area of concern and working with us jointly as agencies in trying to move those actions forward. But is the race on in some respects? I mean, do you, do you kind of informally think to yourself, I want my American side areas of concern off the list before the Canadian side. That's not the way we, we work nope. it in the U.S. at all. No, we have, I mean, for us, the key for moving money to an area of concern is, is that the area of concern is ready for it. So we, our message has been get ready. You know, define your specific actions, the specific locations, and how much you think they're going to cost, and what the picture for all the work in the AOC looks like. And when AOCs and communities come together and they can get to that specific of a list of projects, we've tried to work with them in terms of finding resources, essentially, in a given year to move their, their area of concern along. We have area of concerns that are in sort of different stages. A lot of them did the work in their you know, remedial action plans, but they weren't very specific about, OK, we need five acres of wetland restored here. We need sediments dredged in this location. So keeping in mind that the area of concerns are geographically large. You know, they cover a large area. You might be doing, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten projects in different locations within the area of concern to actually get to those end goals. Gotcha. Chris, I got a half a minute left. I want to give it to you. I think I remember it was a little more than 40 years ago when George Kerr was the environment minister in Ontario and he lost a bet and he had to go swim in Hamilton Bay because he wanted to show everybody how clean it was. I don't think it was a great experience for him. <laughs> but I do want to know when you think Hamilton Harbor will be swimmable drinkable and fishable again so drinkable we get our water from lake ontario so we're already there on that one. we're there on that one uh fishable is more up in the air um studies are ongoing about the health of the fish um, there are numerous invasive species that are causing issues with the restoration of the native fish populations and uh in terms of swimming um this is really the bee in my bonnet uh, i want to repeat you can safely go in Hamilton Harbor in many places most of the time. The big problem are the two uh, artificial beaches, unfortunately. Um, they're not created by Mother Nature. They don't have their water circulation to remove the bacteria that prevents people from going in. So that's an ongoing issue right now. And unfortunately, it's creating part one of those perception issues about swimming in the bay. Gotcha. Well, hopefully we've done something over the past hour to uh, talk more about facts than perception. And I want to thank all four of you for sparing some time away from the Great Lakes Public Forum to come to our studios here at Young and Eglinton and fill us in. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. 
Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.